Hello. Welcome back. If you're new here, my name is Douglas Johnson. I am a certified yoga teacher, Killaby Inquiries facilitator, ordained minister, meditation instructor. And today I wanted to talk about asana, the hammer of yoga tools. So most of you probably met me or uh, become aware, became aware of me because of yoga and specifically what are called asanas, uh, yoga postures. Currently in the current environment, uh, yoga environment, at least in the United States, but from my understanding, and I talk with people from all around the world about this, uh, pretty much throughout the world, this is the yoga tool that has uh, captured the modern imagination, if you will. And it, it's, there's a good reason for it. I don't know that I want to get into it in this particular talk, but it makes sense. Um, but what most people don't realize, and I don't mean to put anybody down here, but I'm going to include most yoga teachers as well, modern yoga teachers who've been trained through one of the um, certified schools with Yoga Alliance. Um, so most students and most teachers of modern yoga are not really aware that the asana tool, the postures that we use in yoga, will not result in yoga. What is yoga? Yoga is union, unification of the individual separate self with the unified whole. Uh, I think many yoga students and many yoga teachers don't even believe that this is possible. They suspect that this is some kind of a um, lofty goal that maybe a saint or a sage uh, experiences, but it's not for me. It's not for uh, Sally who lives in the suburbs of Atlanta and commutes to uh, work on 285. That's too lofty a goal for her and her yoga teacher. It's also too lofty for her yoga teacher. So these things sound nice. Uh, these sound bites, yoga, unification, freedom, liberation, enlightenment, these things all sound really good, but they're just not possible. Uh, and so most people, they just keep doing asanas or postures and they assume that that's what's possible, that that's really all that yoga can deliver. And it does deliver something or else yoga wouldn't be popular. It, it wouldn't, uh, people wouldn't keep coming back if nothing was happening. So what are they getting from their asanas or postures? Well, they're probably getting in shape, fitness, what we want to call fitness. They might be losing some weight. Uh, they might also be getting some nervous system regulation. So they might uh, emotionally and mentally feel more stable. They might feel better overall. In general, if they were depressed or anxious, they might find that the depression and anxiety is reduced some. They might have more energy. Uh, they might start eating better just, uh, you know, because as the body detoxes and feels better and we feel better, we tend to make wiser choices. <laughs> And generally eating well um, is going to, we're just going to feel better and we might naturally be drawn in that direction. Uh, so dietary changes, things of that nature. But is this really all that yoga has to offer us? Is this it? Um, I think for a lot of people, if they're honest, their answer is yes, That that's, that's all we can expect. 
that's all that yoga really is about. But if we read into the literature, we find terms like kundalini, kundalini awakening. So again, is this something that we just want to ignore? Is this something that we just want to say, well, that's a bunch of superstition. And what we're experiencing the, with asanas, that's what, only what's real or what was truthful about yoga. All this other stuff of which most of the writing is actually about. So if you go back through the history of yoga, most of the writing is not about postures or asanas. So if they were so great and so important, why would most of the reading be about psychology, about spirituality, about um, love, devotion, faith, uh, about right action, things of these nature? Why would we find that there's so much writing about this, and then there's so little about this thing that we think is so important. So it's not that asanas are not important or not valuable, but what I would like you to do if you're a student of mine, if you're someone who follows my work, if you're interested in this, even if you came to me by way of yoga postures, you came to me through a yoga class. You love the yoga postures. What I'd like you to start thinking about is that asanas, the postures, are a tool, one amongst many. So my teacher, Paul Grilly, he put it this way, asana is a blunt tool, a blunt instrument. And I think that that's right on the money. I think he hit the nail on the head. Um, so in that spirit, think of asanas almost like a hammer. And what is the old saying? When all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Okay? I really want you to think about that because what most people have in yoga is the yoga hammer, the blunt instrument. It's not to say that it's not a valuable instrument or even a critical instrument to have, but when that's the only instrument, the only tool we have, we tend to solve every problem. We try and solve every problem with that instrument. And I'm here to tell you, as someone who has been immersed in this work for over two decades, that asana cannot solve all of your spiritual problems. <laughs> it's just not the right tool. So what do I mean by this? Well, imagine I gave you a hammer and I gave you some unmilled uh, wood, so like uh, tree trunks that have been chopped down, but they haven't been milled. They haven't been turned into planks of wood or anything. I gave you a hammer, some nails, and some unmilled wood. And I ask you to build falling water, which is one of Frank Lloyd Wright's masterpieces, architectural masterpieces. And I said, okay, use this hammer and these nails to do this job. Build me falling water, okay? Imagine that I asked you to do that. Would you ever in a million years be able to do this? I mean, let's be honest, okay? Let's be real. In a million years, would you be able to, not using anything else, some unmilled uh, logs, lumber, a hammer, and some nails? I think if you're at all honest, the answer has to be no. So for whatever reason in the modern context, people fall in love with asana. And again, I have my suspicions why this is the case. But just because they love 
their hammer. <laughs> they love that tool so much, they then try and just stick with that one tool. And included in this is the, the drop-in yoga class, right? The yoga studio, this whole ecosystem that we've set up. So it, this is no fault of yours. This is just uh, economics and commerce doing what they do. And there's nothing evil there. We just have to be aware that what drives commerce and economics isn't necessarily what's best for the spiritual seeker, what's best for enlightenment, what's best for the planet. <laughs> we have to understand that the drivers of economics uh, are going to produce certain kinds of results. Uh, it's not that they're, they're evil or that they're intrinsically good, but they're just going to be a certain kind of result. And the result is that there tends to be a feedback loop that if something is popular and something sells, the industry produces more of it and caters more. Um, and then it sort of reinforces that. This is this model of uh, economic striving things should be contrasted with the current model that we have in academics, where usually there's a recognition that the most popular class isn't the only class that should be on the schedule. So for instance, if we wanted to look at popularity, then uh, a 101 class is going to be very popular. Introduction to creative writing might be very popular, but what about someone who already is beyond that level, right? Someone who needs more, who needs to go deeper, what we'll find is that a university will still have these classes on the schedule that are not popular, that are not full. These are much smaller, advanced level courses, right? Um, and just because of the nature of them being more advanced, they are going to be smaller. Well, in the current system, and again, I'm speaking from knowledge, and sure, there might always be exceptions to the rule. Uh, so I'm not saying in every instance. So you don't need to worry. I recognize that your studio might be different. You might be different. You might have experienced something different. But most of the time, what we see is the yoga studio is catering to Again, what's most popular? Postures, asanas. And when they put a meditation class on the schedule or something truly deep and meaningful, very often the attendance is low. And because most yoga studios are for-profit businesses, they are thinking about profit. And so they just say, okay, well, we tried that meditation class. We tried that other thing, but it doesn't seem like attendance is that good. So we're going to take that off the schedule. We'll put this power flow class. Those do well. And again, unless you are a rather awake and savvy business person, uh, you are going to mistake the popularity and the money that is being made for good yoga. It's a easy mistake to make um, because in our culture, in the Western, modern Western industrialized culture, we tend to associate good with popular with makes a lot of money. Okay. Uh, it's a, again, a very easy thing to do. And it's a very easy thing to not be aware of that we're doing. So, if we haven't heard of something, very often we think, well, how good can it be, right? If it were really good, I would have heard of it. It would be popular. Uh, that person would be a, a millionaire or a billionaire if they were really, really that good. But again, we have to examine this assumption that popularity equals good. And my experience, that is definitely not the case. So, Asanas, popular, um, 
but just one tool amongst many for the yogi. And like my teacher Paul Grilly pointed out, it's a blunt instrument. It is not a precision instrument. So a surgeon, if she is uh, trying to remove a limb that is sick and damaged and will kill somebody, then she might use a saw, she might use a hammer. But if she's trying to do some work around some very delicate tissue, she might use a scalpel, right? Which is a much more precision, delicate instrument. So again, if I gave a surgeon a saw and a hammer, and I said, I want you to perform open heart surgery on this patient, would she be able to do that? Is there any scenario in which not given the proper tools, she is going to be able to produce this result of open heart surgery that's successful? Again, I hope you understand the answer is no. So again, as much as people want asana postures to be the one tool that I need for enlightenment, for liberation, to free myself of suffering, just going to yoga class, doing these postures, never getting into the psychology, my psychology, never getting into my traumas and my repression, never getting into other practices like pranayams, breathing breath work, right? Never getting into meditation, never getting into the energetic work of bandhas, mudras, never sitting down with a knowledgeable teacher and checking to see, is there a blind spot? Am I missing something? Is there something that I should be doing? We so want to believe that that's all that's necessary. Now, again, there tend to be two camps in modern yoga. So I'm not saying everyone in modern yoga thinks this way. A lot of people, maybe most people, who are coming to modern yoga, and again, I have to include teachers in this, they're just like, yoga is something that makes me feel better. That's it. That's all it can deliver. That's all it ever will deliver. And that's all I ever expect of it. And so this is why in my classes, I will sometimes talk about the deeper end of the pool. What is actually possible with yoga because so many people think that all is possible is I go to this class and I feel a little better. And what I would like to make people aware of is that there's so much more that's possible. How do I know? Because I've experienced it and many people who have worked with me over the years have also experienced it. So there is a greater level of peace and joy that is possible for us as human beings, but most of us don't experience it. Yoga is a set of tools, and you could say a system, but that's a little bit, for me, that's a little iffy because everybody's an individual. And so saying that there's a system that works for everybody, uh, I have my doubts about that. Maybe, uh, I can't say for sure, but I don't think I've seen a system that works for everybody. You might create a system that works for some people, and then what you find is the people it doesn't work for, they just kind of naturally fall off and disappear over time because it's, it's not working for them, or they continue on in frustration. <laughs> and after decades of doing what they've been told to do, uh, you know, they just report that, well, yeah, you know, nothing has really changed. So many people uh, doing yoga, I think, are in the camp of, eh, it's just, it's something I do. I feel a little better. 
uh, I stay in shape, I sweat a bit, um, and that's it. That's all I expect from it. And again, I suspect this is probably most people actually in reality. Then there are those who are aware that yoga uh, can do more for them, that it, it is at least purported to lead to things like enlightenment, uh, freedom. Again, I speak a lot about the peace and joy that's possible. So some people are aware of this, that, okay, uh, there's more to it. However, again, even in this camp, many people think, okay, I'll just go to more yoga classes, or maybe I'll switch to a different style. I've been doing um, Bikram. Why don't I try Ashtanga? That seems more spiritual. Maybe I'll then get enlightenment from that. But even though you might do a little bit of chanting in an Ashtanga class, and it may be a little more spiritual, it might take you a little deeper. Again, we're just talking about a different hammer, essentially. <laughs> okay, we're talking about a different hammer. So what we'd like to do, what I recommend for uh, anyone who's listening to me, is you need to diversify your tool set. The only way you will build falling water, the masterpiece that uh, Frank Lloyd Wright created, right? We're using that as a metaphor for enlightenment and liberation. The only way we'll get there is by having a diverse tool set, not by relying on the hammer alone. So same with open heart surgery. Let's say we're trying to heal, we're trying to become whole, and we are, or we're trying to help somebody, and we're just using a hammer and a saw, these blunt instruments that, again, a surgeon has these tools at their disposal. Why? Because they may be necessary for certain types of intervention certain uh, situations, but they aren't the only tool. Um, we need other tools for other situations. So this is where working with a knowledgeable teacher um, and educating yourself about these things with a teacher or on your own, beginning to apply the different tools, um, these are the steps that I would recommend that you take. Instead of approaching your spiritual life or your pursuit of yoga liberation with the hammer alone, again, all I have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. I try and apply the hammer to every situation. Instead of doing that, recognize that we have all these other tools uh, more than I could name or talk about in this video, but all these other tools, and if we can skillfully apply the right tool to the right situation, we will make a lot more progress. And yoga is a beautiful system, or I, again, system is probably not the right word. It's a beautiful tool set for us to have. And over time, after working with a knowledgeable teacher and studying, we may eventually begin to intuitively know which tool to use when. And that's a beautiful thing. And if we ever get confused, we can reach out to our teacher. But after a while, we begin to know. And I've, as, as I've mentioned in other videos, this is where I see some of my longtime students are, is they can intuitively know which tool to apply um, to a situation to hopefully get them through any blocks or resistance that they're experiencing, any suffering that is arising for them, and they're able to resolve that and return to the peace and joy of this amazing miracle that is a human life. All right, everyone. So I hope you enjoyed today's talk. If you have any questions, please let me know. 
As always, I would love to hear from you. So please leave me a comment below. Let me know your experience with these things. Have you branched out from just using asana as a way of regulating or feeling a little better as a the one-stop shop for your spiritual needs? Or are you still very much obsessed and in love with asanas? If you are, it's okay. It tends to be a phase and you don't have to feel guilty or bad about that. Just be aware that it is a phase and it is something that you eventually would like to outgrow when the time is right. When the time is right, it is going to be different for everybody. So again, for some people, they might find for the rest of their lives, they never outgrow this obsession and reliance on asana, and that is okay. And for those people, that is the right tool for them at the right time. If you've heard this talk, if you've introspected, if you've looked and you find that, you know, really using other tools is, is not right for you at this time, maybe you even work with a teacher and they say, hey, yeah, I think you should stick with asana. Not a teacher that only teaches asanas, by the way, because again, then the teacher is probably their only tool is a hammer. And so they are also trying to uh, solve every problem with that hammer. So you want to be with a teacher who talks about and teaches and encourages other practices. If there were one practice that I were to say is the Swiss army knife of practices, the closest thing to the practice that does it all, it would be meditation and specifically Zen meditation. In the Zen tradition, that is the primary practice. And in my experience, and even if I look at modern teachers, many of the most realized modern teachers that I'm aware of, they all have at least dabbled with or even dove really deeply into Zen meditation. So this is the primary type of meditation that I teach. If you're interested in learning it, if you're on Patreon, you can just search for meditation. You will find lots of links um, or uh, not links, but posts where I give instruction. And if you'd like to receive instruction from me personally, you can reach out to me. We can set up a session um, and you can receive instruction from me directly. Um, but if you are hard up financially, if you don't feel comfortable reaching out, then again, I have resources that are there for free. So again, not all tools are created equally. As valuable and as important as a hammer might be, as irreplaceable in certain cir circumstances, uh, something like a Swiss army knife might be more useful in more situations. And so this is what I would, uh, the analogy I would create with something like Zen meditation. This is a very versatile tool and a very refined tool, a tool that can take us very far, um, but it can be tricky. So I'd say this, a hammer is probably more fun to use. A hammer is more fun. We can swing it, we can bash things, we can do all kinds of things. So same with asana. Asana is fun. It's fun to go, to go to a group class. It's fun to do postures. And I do want to be clear, I am not encouraging you to stop going to classes, to stop doing asana, okay? Throughout your whole path, I recommend you still devote time and energy to do that because it is such a helpful practice. What I am encouraging is if you haven't already to start to diversify what you're exploring. Diversify 
the way you explore your spirituality. And don't assume what you explore is necessarily going to bowl you over. Okay? So again, asana is a blunt tool. It's like a hammer. It creates a big, loud impact. So the first time you go to a breathwork class, the first time you go to a sound bath by a, a, a true sound healer, the first time you go to a kirtan, the first time you do mudra or bandha work, the first time you try meditation, um, don't expect to be bowled over, okay? That is a little bit like expecting a paintbrush uh, to do what a hammer does. So we have to be ready to move into more and more subtle uh, experiences. Here's the irony. The really su sublime, blissful experiences are subtle ones. I know that that might sound like a contradiction, and in a sense it is. It doesn't make sense. But those experiences where we're like, oh my God, I am so happy to be alive. I can't believe how amazing life is. This is a lot of times when maybe there's a breeze on our face or we look up and we see the trees or uh, we wake up in the morning in our bed and we just open our eyes and we see the sunshine streaming through the window. So this is what I'd like you to understand that a blissful experience is not winning the lottery. It's not getting married. These are fine experiences. They are perhaps joyful, happy, memorable experiences. I'm not saying don't have them. But what I am pointing you to is something more subtle. And again, if we reject the subtle, because we're like, well, it's not a hammer. It's not bowling me over. I'm not blown away. Uh, it's not like the plant medicine experience I had. I'm not um, tripping my mind out, right? If we have these kinds of expectations, well, then we're going to miss the subtle experience. And I'm here to tell you that that subtle experience is where the real payoff is, where the real bliss and joy and peace is. Um, we can't keep having these peak experiences uh, and keep topping them, which if you watched my last video about hedonic adaptation, this is what many of us are trying to do, is we are trying to just keep turning up the volume. Oh, that was good. Then we get adapted to it. Okay, I, I need more. Let, let, let's do more. Let's go bigger. Let's get a bigger hammer, um, right? And so we try and go bigger and that might work for a little while, but how big can we get, right? At a certain point, we, we run out of bigness. Uh, you know, once I'm playing a giant festival or stadium as a rock star, like, where do I go from there? How, where's up from there? Once I'm president, where, how do I go up from there? Okay. Whereas with yoga and spirituality, when we understand the subtle stream that is accessible to us and we tap into that, and that is never ending. <laughs> that is always here. Every moment is this beautiful, wonderful stream and connection that is available to us. And it's, it's there for everybody. And it's right there, right now. It is not far from you, it is not distant. It's not even difficult to get in touch with it. 
but because you are looking for an explosion, because you are listening out for a big bang, because you're expecting a hammer blow, you're missing it, okay? All right, everyone, thanks again. Leave me a comment. If you're on YouTube, please like, subscribe, say hello. If you're on Patreon and you are supporting me as a patron, I am so grateful to you. And all of those listening that are not patrons should also be grateful to you because you are making this possible. Until next time, everyone, thank you so much for listening. Namaste. Have a beautiful day.